kind of warm up because I'm really going to talk a lot about that today. Not healing, but how each of you have been called to do God's work. And we talked about that last week, but I'm going to say that again. Each one of you have been called to do God's work. And this morning I'm really going to just spend time just trying to stir a fire in you. It's really not going to be real Bible heavy, but I'm going to kind of put my evangelism hat on and say, what does it take to get y'all to stand up and talk about Jesus freely? And I'm not just saying just preaching the gospel on a street corner. But I'm going to show y'all there are ways to serve Jesus that you probably never thought about. And I know that each one of you are called to do it. And so, just as an opening thought was the idea that even healing is available to everybody, right? Is the cross available to everybody? Then healing is available to everybody. So it's just a thought to say, you know what? I don't have to be a gifted minister of the gifts of healing to preach healing. Jesus has already done it. Because by his stripes we are healed. So you all have a part in this equation, but the question is, do we, do we know what we're sitting on? And so last week, I remember we talked about something very important. Remember last week's message? Anybody want to throw me a thought out there? The true power of God was what? I don't know what the true power means, though. Okay, it's exactly that true power. It's okay. I'm not picking on you. The gospel of Jesus Christ. Remember that? Now, he gave the taste of it to the apostles, to the 70, and even Jesus. But then, remember, Jesus had a very enigmatic verse. John 14, 12. He said, the works I do, you'll do, but you'll do great. Why did he say that? Who remembers? Why did he say such a weird thing? Thank you, Lord. Because Jesus was sent to only the lost sheep of Israel. But he told us we must preach this gospel of the kingdom to the entire world. So he gave us a global vision, a global calling. And he gave those 12 of the 70. He said, go not to the Samaritans or the Gentiles, but only go to Israelites. So don't tell me that the power that you now carry is less than that. Why? I gave you all some stories. Remember Jeremiah? Why was Jeremiah given the power of prophecy? Because God commanded him to do what? Speak to the house of Israel. Not speak his own words, but God's words. So in Jeremiah 1, he says, Well, God, I'm too young to talk. God said, I didn't ask you that. Here's my finger, so now you have my words. Now go say what I said. So the power you were given related directly to the command, or the calling, or what you were required to do. Moses was asked to do what? Deliver all of Israel, Israel from Egypt. That's quite a task. So what did he give them? The power, the signs, the wonders, a very unique ministry. Because his task was very high. Jonah was given a task. Isaiah, Ezekiel, Daniel. All these guys were given very unique tasks. Deborah, the judges, you study it. Samson. I remember Gideon. Like these guys were all given tasks, but then God would give them something to do it. But the true power I called it, the greatest power, is the gospel of Jesus Christ to the world because it has the biggest calling. So I said it last week, you're all sitting on golden eggs. You actually have the greatest power there ever it will be. Believe it or not, you can trust me on this or you can get there one way or another. You will be the greatest power you ever get. There's no greater power than the gospel of Jesus Christ. But what happened is many of us don't realize it. And so I just want to say that again. The power you're given directly relates to the command you're given. What did he say in Matthew 28? Go, therefore, to all the world and preach the gospel, right? Baptizing them, Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Y'all know the scriptures. And you've been given this command. No one said, well, that's not for me, right? Everybody's got this command. The question is, what's going on? What's going on? So that's our topic this morning. We're going to talk about a sermon I call, call waiting. Because we're all doing something, right? And there's a call on the other line that we're waiting for. And I believe that call waiting light has been on your phone for years. From the minute you came to Jesus, that call waiting light was on. Y'all down with that? That's my street talk, I guess. Are y'all okay with this? Sorry. Work talk, I guess. But this is my key point, friends. All of us have that call. I believe it's God waiting on you more than us waiting on God. And a lot of us feel like we're waiting on God, but I'm telling you, friends, the call has been Waiting. And I'm going to make it as literal as I can. And you know me, I'm going to ramp up as we continue. So let's first get this idea. How do I know biblically that we're all called? Is that okay? Let's biblically show that every one of you has a call waiting. 2 Peter 1, verse 10. It's right there in your New Testament scripture. 
2 Peter 1 verse 10 says, Therefore, brethren, be even more diligent to make your call and election sure. For if you do, these things you will never stumble. Let's just look at that again. Y'all remember the Family Matters series? Who is the family? It's actually the church, right? Those who obey God and listen. So not everybody in church obeys and God listens. So the family of God is those who actually obey. Remember Jesus said, they said, oh, Jesus, your mother and your brother are looking for you. Remember your sisters and all that? He goes, my mother, brother, sisters are those who hear and obey. Yeah, thank you. So that's my family. So who's Peter talking to? Family, right? Brethren's another word for family. So talking to family, he says, make sure your call and election, I'm going to add the word, are real. That makes sense. So let me look at this verse again. Is he talking to just Timothy? Ezekiel? Syntaki? Niger? Philip? He says, brethren, anybody who's a family of God must have a calling. Everybody okay with that? That means everyone who's got a calling. The minute you came to the family of God, you have a calling. Okay. Second verse. Ephesians 2 verse 10. A lot of it over. Ephesians 2 verse 10 says, For we, being us, the family, are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works. Let's call it a calling there. Which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in our calling. We should walk in that. So, what's very interesting is, there is a great myth, or let me call it misunderstanding operating in church. Y'all have heard it. You ever use this phrase or heard this phrase, that guy has a great calling of God on him. Y'all know that phrase. Oh man, he's got the call of God. She's just waiting for the call. You know why their life is so hard? The call of God is waiting on them. You all have, don't tell me you've never heard that. I've heard it more times than count. Oh man, that guy really has a call of God on him. You know they're actually very right. But here's what happened. By using those words, we have segregated the church into bench warmers and players. Because somebody has a call of God on them, and somebody doesn't. Go back to 2 Peter 1, verse 10 again for me. Now tell me how that's biblically correct, to say that somebody has a call of God, and somebody doesn't. Is that true? Who's he talking to? The family of God, right? If you're family, you must have a calling. So don't tell me somebody, quote, has a calling. Because everybody does. That's like saying, hey, by the way, you've got hair. Well, most of us do. It's kind of slowing down. But it's all right. I'm hanging out on my face. But uh, the truth be told, every one of us does. So when you hear that, don't come and kick him in the head and be like, oh, you know, I'm immature and young you. Say, yeah, you mean well. But truth be told, to come, hey, 2 Peter 1.10. 2 Peter 1, verse 10 says, everybody does. So what do you think the problem is? Most people don't even know. Does that make sense? I don't think very many people know their calling. So again, I just want to highlight my first thought this morning. Y'all agree everybody has a calling? Mm -hmm. See, I've got a good group here. I don't have to argue. Plus, I'm talking. And so my point is, everybody has a calling when they became the family of God. That's all right, okay? What was the second point? Ephesians 2.10. God has already established his calling. When? Even before you knew it. Let me ask you this, friends. Did they have to invent shoes for my kids? They were already there, right? Nobody picks up a shoe and goes like, this would work well on my hand. You already have a calling that fits you. Why? Because God made it for you. Did y'all get that? I don't go to the store going, I don't know what to do. I need some kind of cloth that fits over my daughter and her arms have to fit through the holes. But somehow with the church, I don't know what my calling is. I mean, I just don't know. I mean, God must have it somewhere. But yet, when it comes to the natural things of this world, I need milk, I need food, I need bread. You know what you want immediately. But why is it when it comes to God? It's like this big mystery. Does that make sense? Now, I'm not saying you guys aren't on the show. I'm not trying to kick you when you're down. But I'm saying, should it be a mystery that the calling of God that he's so sure about for you, that he specifically made for you, seems to be the most distant from the person who needs it the most. Why would it be distant from you? Why do I need another man to come fly in and give me a prophetic word what my calling is? See, it's very young. It's a very young believer. I'm okay with that. 
But I don't mean to make this church young. I'm actually, I set the bar very high for y'all. And so my point is, friends, I want us to understand that. So again, the first point was, are we in agreement you all have a calling? Yes. So what's the problem? Most people don't know what they're calling. And so that's going to be a lot of our discussion. So, I want to put this thought out there, friends. Y'all know there are people in church that are kind of like, I'm here and I'm good, right? You know, there are people that you have to drag to church, and there are people that are, are running for God, right? Those three groups are kind of general, but they make sense. You think if you don't know what you're supposed to do for God, it's easy to serve them? Wouldn't you kind of be like idle? Wouldn't you feel like, man, I still don't, I mean, I would love to run for God. I mean, search your hearts. Let's just say I could take individually each one of you, and I could just close out this entire world, take out all your thoughts and worries, and I gave you everything. I looked at Jesus and said, will you look at him and run for him? I think everybody would. I really think everybody has a desire to run for God. I just don't think they know where to go. I think for many of us, when you first get saved, you start running hard for God, and then you hit that first plateau, and you're like, what do I do now, right? What do I do? Like, I'm here, and then you just kind of idle off. And so what ends up happening is you end up becoming like a bench warmer, like an Astros game. Even worse, sometimes we just become the fans. We're just in the back. We're just happy to be there. But that's not the case. Every one of you has been called to wear that star uniform, as y'all know. But the problem is we don't always know what to do. So, see, this is my point, friends. I'm not trying to kick you. I'm saying every one of you has a desire to serve God. I don't think the question is not the desire, but where does that desire go? I'm going to make this simple for you. I work in an environment in a chemical plant where there's tons of, like, fishers, hunters, and gun collectors. Is that, is that fair? <laughs> fishers, hunters, and gun collectors? Now, I'm going to ask you something. Do you think those kids were born hunters? Or fishers or gun collectors? What do you think your dad probably did? Took him to the range, took him to duck lease, took him on a boat, said, hold the fishing rod, put the lure, and maybe the dad helped him and caught a fish. And after a couple of years, he said, you know what? I really love fishing. Does it make sense? Mm -hmm. Now, I don't really know fishing very well, okay? I don't. And I don't really know hunting, and I don't really know guns. Because I don't know if I really grew up around it, but I have my own passions. So what am I telling you, friends? Some of your passions are just your default behavior because you haven't been exposed to what God has made you for. Does that make sense? So I want to say that again. The reason you're not realizing your passion is because you're not being exposed to what you're passionate about. I'm going to clarify that. So these guys at work that are so big on guns and hunting and leases and $80,000 trucks is because they were brought up that way. But the Christian church is not exposing the church, the body, to the passion of God. So naturally, they're going to do what? They're going to sit idle. Does, does that make sense? Yeah. If I take y'all three on a boat, I leave you three home. You're going to be sitting there like, oh, we're on vacation. Is that really blaming them? Maybe they love boats. The first time I got on a boat, I said, this is awesome. There's no cops. <laughs> Rolling down the road, no legs or anything. That was a jet ski. That was awesome. But I'd never known that. And so when you guys say, well, I'm not that passionate about God. My, my friend's not passionate about God. My, my sister, my dad, they're not really in church. Friend, I would challenge you to think harder. Is it because they're not interested? Or have you not found their passion? Does that make sense? And so what the world does, being the devil, he's pretty good with his little horns. He goes, I know these people of God are built for passion because they wouldn't come to Jesus. So I'm just going to drop down little boxes of gifts and things that maybe aren't as important. And so what is a good desire in you becomes passionate for things of this world. Not that you were drawn to idols, but because you just didn't know where to go with it. Now, I'm not making excuses for idol worship. I'm just saying I don't believe the church was made to sit idle. Does this make sense? Now, I believe the church was designed to be global. I believe the church was designed to turn the world upside down, just like they said in Acts 5. But what happened to Acts? Where is it? The church is who? Y'all. If the church isn't being challenged, and the church isn't being given exposure or passion, of course the world domination vision, not domination, but the world, the church that should serve God and serve people, is just continuing to what? Saturate, dilute, and become 
that wants to visit them. We have so many churches in the city, and yet tons of non-Christians drive by going, so what? Does that make sense? Just look at this area alone. I can lose count. It's just a street. There's what, four or five? On just this street. And yet people drive by every day. So what? It's because we've been deluded. Because the body is not fulfilling the call. So 2 Peter 1.10 says, Every one of you must make sure your calling and election are clear. Does that make sense? See, I'm doing a lot of thinking about church because I, I spent a lot of time on it. And I'm trying to understand where is it? Why did it die off, so to speak? Why is it only serving a certain sector? Shouldn't it address the world? But see, in this church alone, we have nations of El Salvador and Africa and India and America and all nations around us that y'all can reach. So it was designed to reach nations, but it's just reaching a small circle of pastors. That's the problem. So let's get out of the box. Again, every one of you has a calling. Where is this church going? The church has been called to talk about a global calling. Why? Last week I said to have true power is to have a calling that matches it. Does it make sense? If your calling is to serve the world, then God will give you global power. Just as he gave Moses the power to overthrow Pharaoh. But you've got to have a calling. Can I just ask God for all the gifts of the Spirit and the power of God to do everything and just sit on my couch? But if I said, God, you're calling me to do something great then he would give it to you right then. So what am I saying? As I begin to show you how to realize your calling, what comes with it? The power of God to do it. So please, friends, I'm not just saying, oh, okay, you're not working for God. I'm saying, I'm going to show you how to be equipped with what you learned last week. Last week, again, was the gospel that must be presented to nations. And we did an altar call where I asked God to really touch you. But here's the gap. If you don't have a place to put it, if there's no place to put that in your weapon, what good is it for you? So this week we must realize the calling. That's why I named the sermon, Calling. How do we realize the calling? Are you ready for this? this second point. There's a lot of talk. But second point, how do you realize your calling? I told you it wasn't a lot of verses. It's more, I just want you to listen and understand. Do y'all remember the analogy about the hunters and fishers and gun collectors and politicians? Some people get really fanatical about politics. I used a word there earlier. I just want you to write step two is exposure. Exposure. So step one is to realize everyone of you has a call. Everyone of you has a call. 2 Peter 1 verse 10. Ephesians 2 verse 10. The second step to realize my calling is exposure. Exposure. I'm going to pick on a girl here. Not pick on her literally. Just reference her. When this girl came to Jesus, she didn't know much about healing. But when she was exposed to it, she probably talks about it more than everything else. Does that make sense? So when I met her, she didn't really know much about healing. Maybe she had some desire to be a healing person, I guess. But I don't think so. But when God showed her what the healing ministry is, she said, I'm all in. Does that make sense? So exposure activated the call in her life. Do you think God had already made it for healing? The Bible says it was preset. Before you even knew God, it was already there. So you only just came to realize what God had already had. Call waiting. How many of y'all understood that? I hope that made sense. I'm going to give you one more story, and we'll get it, hit some more topics. There was a young man about nine years ago, in his 20s even, and he was confused, well-meaning, but trying to make sense of a world that was very dark. And he couldn't understand all these circumstances that just didn't seem to go his way. And he was in and out of church, and he didn't really know what to do about church, but he really enjoyed messages. And that young man found himself in a church, and he didn't know why he was there, and he wanted to leave, but he stayed. And a very unassuming man came to the front and preached a message, and he's like, okay, great, a sermon, good. I don't see it especially. But then that man began to call everybody from the church one by one, packed the altar with about 200 people, and on the mic, he began to pray over everybody. And they started crying and weeping, and people fell over. And this young man said, I've never seen that in my life. I've never seen that in my life. And so that preacher came to that young man and began to tell him things that he was going to do. And this young man said, this man is prophesying over me. I've never seen that in my life. 
And having been exposed to it, the young man said, from now on, I'll serve God for the rest of my life. So my point is, friends, exposure means when you take a person who is lost and you show them ministry, that person with me, and you say, this is church, they'll say, I don't know what I've been doing for 30 years. Does that make sense? Why do I say all that? There's no formula. You look at testimonies of every minister, whether Peter Kumar, Michael Boaz, I don't care who you pick, JJ, you know, all these guys, uh, sorry, Teal, I forget his name. I'm going to blank here for a moment. But uh, Teal Law is born, of course, and, uh, and uh, they've got several healers, William Branham, A.A. A. Allen, Jack Coe. They all have their own stories, right? But the truth be told, I can't mirror that story, you can't mirror that story either. But they were exposed to it. Y'all know Benny Hinn's story? He went to that lady, Catherine Coleman. Mm -hmm. He said he got exposed to her power. He said, what in the world is that? And he just sent him off. Right? That makes sense. And you read these guys and something happened to them. They said, I didn't know God could do that. I didn't know God could be that way. And so they went from a very ordinary life to a very supernatural life. So what I'm trying to tell you, friends, is I'm not going to tell you exactly how to go and become your calling. I'm going to tell you what you're missing. You're not exposed to it. Now, I'm not saying everybody in here is just sitting on a chair bored of their mind. I'm saying is, why are you not seeing more of God? Maybe it's time to be exposed to something. Does that make sense? You know, when I grew up in church, there's no such thing as an apostle or a prophet. So the first time I saw a prophet, I freaked out. I literally, like... My brain came to a grinding halt. I said, how is this man praying over everybody around me? And they're crying. He doesn't even know that he's like 30 seconds the next guy. And they're like falling on the floor crying. That just blew. I said, like, where is this in church? So the biggest problem for me is exposure. Because the church in itself, mainstream church, you know doesn't really involve apostles and prophets. The second problem with church is they don't really say that you are a people of God. You're a lay people. And there's a clergyman. You want to make me angry? Call me all lay people, you make me really angry. What I'm saying is, we segregated y'all from, I say we, the church, mainstream church, has segregated you from a calling by saying, this is the call group, and what are you? A bunch of sheep? We're Jesus sheep. I'll be Jesus sheep any day of the week. But you're not made to just be followers, you're made to leave for God. Is that making sense? And the problem is, no one has invested a calling in you. Now, I can't spend time with you all every day of the week, but you can spend time with somebody. How many of you guys ever thought about traveling with a minister, or serving a ministry, or serving a gospel crusade, or spending time with needy people, or broken people, or those who need food and clothing and shelter? Counseling, learning how to counsel those in suffering and abuse and divorce. Learning how to lead people who need leadership like mentors, teenagers, drug addicts, street people, people that want to get jobs, people that don't have... Do you know what I'm saying? When you say, Michael, I don't really have this calling of God. I just feel like I'm just called to sit in church. How many things have you exposed yourself to? Really? How many? Probably not much. I think for most of us, we've probably just come to church every week. And you're saying, well, my job is to come to this church. Oh, no, no. See, Jesus warned about a man. Y'all remember the parable of talents? Mm -hmm. Matthew 25, there's a guy with one talent. And he said, that's all I got. And his grumpy attitude didn't really pay off very well, did it? He hid that talent and said, well, I'm saved. I'm going to heaven, right? I'm saved. I'm going to heaven. And I was like, that's all you can do? That's all you can do is just go to heaven? Didn't really go to heaven, did he? Not a really good call. I'm not threatening you. But as a beloved friend, I'm here to tell you, Jesus is investing so much more in you. And you feel like, I don't have a calling. Yes, you do. Why? Who is the one that gave you the calling? 2 Peter 1.10, he says, Jesus has invested a calling when? Before you were born. So let's just recap my second point before I move ahead. How do you realize that calling? You just haven't seen it yet. Now, I'm not saying for some of you that serve God right now, you don't have a calling. But I'm saying if you're feeling low, if you're feeling a plateau, if you're feeling bored in church, maybe it's time to spread your wings a little. That's why some of you have that dream, like I told you about. So the point is, friends, God's asking you to let, let go 
You say, I got free time. I got things to do. I'm busy. No, you be busy for God first. He'll take care of the rest. Remember what he says? If you seek the kingdom first, all these things shall be added to you. All right. So, everybody okay with me? Am I making sense? Yes. Good. How did Jesus start every calling? He looked at some apostles, some men of God. He gave them two words. He said, follow me. Every calling starts with follow me, right? Every calling starts with follow me. But you're already doing that, right? You're already following Jesus. You go to church, you're in your Bible, you're praying, I hope. And, and in that calling, in those early stages, you begin to know who Jesus is. But if you're in that place, good. If that's where you're at, great. But now I want to get to the advanced section. Okay, so now that we got all that clear, I've given you, everyone is calling, I want to show you how to get that passion. Now how do we advance it? But some of you guys are already in your calling. So I don't want to leave you bored and dry. Some of you guys are just now getting warmed up. I want to give you a target to aim for. And some of you guys are saying, I don't even know what I'm doing in my life. If that's you, then that was me. That was absolutely me. So how do we grow in this calling. Friends, I want you to write the word co-laborer. That's a big word. Co-laborer. Laborer meaning worker. And you're a co-worker. Here's the deal, friends. In this street today, it's somehow created a grading system. Oh, you teach Sunday school? Oh, that's all? Oh, I do this. Why do we weigh each other? All I'm asking you, friends, is you begin your calling and God gives you something to do, don't say, is that all? When you become a co-laborer of Christ, just accept the call. Does it make sense? The first thing you have to do is erase whatever that devilish lie in your head says, is, oh, i got other things to do than that. Oh, you need me to come paint the church? Paint the church then. You need me to come help out with the feeding outside for a homeless facility? Go and do it. Don't go, oh, I don't know if that's going to KO anybody, and I don't know if anybody's going to be raised from the dead. See, you... Somehow you thought, I'm supposed to do something great. You will. But why is it we deep out? Why is that not serving God? What did Jesus say to the sheep and goats? When you do the, something to the least, you've done to me. See, Jesus removes the score system right there. Matthew 25, again, sheep and the goats. He removes the scoring system. But you know today we have scores. Oh, I'm chief diocese's master prophet guy. That's okay, but... If this girl over here is cooking for people that don't have food, she's serving the least of them. She's called Jesus' friend. Do you understand that? So when you become a co-laborer for Christ, the first thing I want to do is no scores, friends. Don't start thinking I don't have a good testimony because I don't do this. You are co-laboring with Jesus because he said you are doing it to the least of me. So I want to just get that out of here. I don't want that here. I really don't care for pride. Second point I want you to understand. I mean, I remember 1 Corinthians 12. It said there's a body. The body has eyes, ears, arms, legs, feet. So if you begin to score, are you saying you don't need feet? How many of y'all want to lose your feet right now? I've got some scissors. No. You don't want to lose a pinky either. You wouldn't sell me your pinky for a million. I hope not. If you do, I'd talk to you. <laughs> and so somehow we think that if we begin to serve alongside of God... There is a, oh, I'm this or I'm that, or I'm not honored, or I'm not lifted up. So what? You're part of the body. Now let me show you what happens when you co-labor with God. You become what? Part of the body. Everybody understand that? Now I want to show you what happens when you begin to take your calling alongside of God. I want you to write down Romans 11, 16 and 17. So if I become part of somebody very strong, do I not carry their... Strength? Yes. If I become part of somebody who's very anointed, do I not carry their anointing? Yes. Read Romans 11, 16, 17. It says this. For the first fruit is holy, the lump is also holy, and if the root is holy, so are the what? Branches. Stop right there. If I connect with whatever calling I've got, even if it's just to help out some children who need to read a Bible, if... God is holy, and His first work is holy, and the root of Him is holy, and by connecting Him, I become what? I become holy. Now, I'm a branch, but what do I become? Holy. See why the devil tries to stop you from working for God? When you connect to Jesus through your calling, 
suddenly you are now connected to the resources of heaven. Remember what I told you last week? How do you get true power? You must connect to your calling. So Romans 11 gives us a farming analogy. As soon as I connect to the branch of God, the vine of God, Jesus divine, I connect to the vine, suddenly his lifeblood, his anointing, his power, his holiness, his wisdom comes to me. Why do I say wisdom? God calls me to teach the Bible to children. Then God must give me teaching ability. Correct? God wants me to go help people in counseling needs. Then God must give me the spirit of counsel. Let's say 11. God must give me counsel. Do y'all follow that? So it's not a matter of going, well, I don't know what to do. No, friend. Recognize that God is the source of it. Some of us are so pent up with this big box idea. I'm going to run 45 miles, fast for three weeks straight, and then I'm going to chase God. No, just take the calling, friend. Just take that call. That call waiting, take the call. And once you connect, then you are given what? You being a wild olive tree were grafted among them, and with them, everybody say this word, you became a? A partaker louder. You became a? Partaker of the roots and fatness of the olive tree. That means Jesus Christ, the anointed one, starts flowing through your body. All the trees that they anoint you well. Okay, you have to know the Bible here. In Levitical law, they take olives for anointing well. So he's saying, you become a partaker of God's anointing. Where do you think I get it from? It's not some secret. I don't know why it's some secret. It's not a secret. If you become a minister or servant of God, you now connect to his ability to teach, to pray, to serve, to love, to guide, and 45,000 other things to do. So if you understand my heart this morning, it's not to teach, it's just to evangelize you, to say, what are you waiting for? What's your excuse? What is it that you, quote, don't have from God that he will give you the minute you connect to the body by laboring with him? I want to give you another analogy this morning, friends. John chapter 15. John chapter 15 talks about the vine and the branch. Jesus is divine. We are the branches. And he says in verse 5, I am the vine, you the branches. He who abides in me and I in him, what? Bears much fruit. The minute you take your co-laborer calling. I didn't say what your labor is. That's your business. I'd love to share with you in that and help you grow. But the minute you become a co-laborer, you now abide in Jesus so that you will now bear fruit. So that means what you do for God must be successful. Successful. Co-laborers with Jesus are successful. Philippians 1 6, the work I began in you, I will surely finish. Philippians 1 6. You know how many times I've told people when God calls you something, He never calls you a failure? He won't call you a failure. But if you come into a challenge like Moses, what did you learn? You must be given new power. God showed Moses three powers in that rod. How many did it release? Ten. Come on, guys. So God never calls you fair, but He calls you to great ability and results we call success. Daniel had a spirit of excellence. One day you'll understand what I just said. Daniel had a spirit of excellence. He knew he was called to succeed. He was a foreigner, an immigrant, in a Babylonian nation. Why did he win that contest? That was supposed to be about Babylonian history, Babylonian language, Babylonian customs and traits. And yet Daniel wins? Come on, man. I want to make a joke about Indians winning spelling bees, but that's okay. <laughs> <laughs> My point is, friends, you understand the spirit of excellence when you connect to Jesus. And when you connect to him, your calling must succeed. Your calling must succeed. I'm going to go over a little bit. Y'all can handle this? Good. We talked a lot about Moses last week and the previous weeks about a co-laborer. How many rods were actually at work at that point? It wasn't just Moses that was using a rod. There was another man with a rod. Aaron. A co-laborer with the same power? Oh, that's deep. Let's think. Who was God waiting for in that wilderness all that time? Moses. If God was waiting for Moses for so long, why does he need Aaron? 
Moses asked for help. Did y'all get that? And he gave Aaron another rod that he didn't even show Moses. Did y'all get that? Study again Exodus. You're going to find out that Moses says, tell Aaron to lift his rod to Pharaoh, and that power will come forth. A co-laborer has power. He has power. I'm telling you that man has power. Aaron has his own rod. It wasn't there in that burning bush. It wasn't there when the angel of the Lord was speaking to him. It wasn't there in the mountain. God just gave him a rod. I mean, I understood that. Why? Because God is power. Your God that you connect to, that vine, that branch, just think of the plug in the wall. If I plug it in and get the vacuum cleaner going, if I plug it in there, 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 and there, or if I get another vacuum cleaner and plug it in there, 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 I'm still plugging into the power. So Aaron was a co-laborer to Jesus, and now his rod has power. Do you understand that? He plugged in. He plugged into Moses. Do you understand that? That's why I said the body has so much power. When you plug into a ministry, you receive its power. Does that mean? Labor with it. How many of you understood that? These are not secrets, but they're powerful. The devil hates this stuff. That's why the devil would rather you be at home. Because he knows that you can believe only these five people have power. And I was like, well, I couldn't stop those five because they're just nuts. So, okay, well, at least I can rest on my backside because you guys aren't doing anything. But if somebody were to tell you that Aaron's rod isn't really all that special, but the minute he connected to Moses. Remember, was Aaron alive? Aaron's older than Moses, right? Was he there at that scene? No. But the minute he came alongside Moses, suddenly that little shepherd staff he had became powerful. Did y'all get that? It was the same variety he had last week. He doesn't know that Moses is talking about a fiery bush. He doesn't talk about the fiery bush. He's over here and doing his thing in Paraland, right? Suddenly Moses comes awake and Moses says, God, I want my brother. Okay. So Aaron comes along. I've got my staff. Whoa, what happened? He connected it. Did y'all get that? Why are y'all so different? Who said you're different? John 14, 12. The works I do, was he talking to just 12? Mm -mm, it's not you. You'll do, and greater, because you must receive your calling. When you receive your calling, you will operate in power you've never imagined. Now, I'm not telling you over a nice time to pick a flight to China. Maybe not. But I'm trying to get you to think bigger. I'm trying to expand. Global vision isn't an overnight thing. It's something that you're taught and trained and raised up in. And when you say, you know what, I'm ready, like Isaiah 6, you'll start seeing things change your life dramatically. But God wants to change you. And God will start with you even young. I'm not going to wait until Sarah's in college to teach her English. I'm going to teach her English now. I'm going to teach her math now. But at some point, she's raised up to that level where she's released into a, a professional environment. So God wants to raise you in that thought. A couple more announcements. Remember when Je uh, Jethro, Moses' father-in-law, saw Moses working all day and night? Mm -hmm. He said, what, is this good? No, it ain't good. It's like flat coat. <laughs> it's warm. No one wants that at the end of the day. It's hot outside. He said, Moses, the thing you ain't doing is good, boss. He said, I want you to get some help. And God told Moses, hey, that old man's right. Go get how many? Get 70 elders. And I will take of their spirit. Read for me Numbers 11, 16 through 17. Tell me about this co-labor business. Numbers 11, 16, 17. So the Lord said to Moses, this is a dance section. Gather to me 70 men of the elders of Israel, whom you know to be elders of the people and offers over them. That means they were being prepped for what? Leadership, right? Did y'all catch that? These were ordinary people. These were just people, officers and leaders. They were growing. They were growing. They were maturing. And bring them to the tabernacle meeting that they may stand there with you. Now go to verse 17. What's going to happen? I will come down and talk to you there. I will take of the Spirit. That's God's Spirit, not Moses' ability, but God's Spirit. But it's upon Moses, and put the same Spirit upon those 70, and they shall become co believers. How many of you So the minute they took on Moses' burden, they were given Moses power. Oh, interesting, right? So they didn't have rocks. They were judges. Moses had to deal with the law. He had to deal with wisdom and counsel and arguments and disputes and land battles and all kinds of things. So don't tell me they didn't get a spirit of understanding. They got the work that was according to their job title. Y'all follow that? He said, well, the word with these guys doing the miracles. What was their job? What did Ruel say? Jethro. 
You can't sit there all day and listen to people. Did you all hear this? Mm -hmm. But they were given power to help deal with people's problems. He wasn't called to talk to Pharaoh. I'm sorry, the 70 weren't called to talk to Pharaoh. They were called to help people. So you don't see Moses sitting in a chair from morning till night anymore. Did you understand that? Please tell me you understood. The calling was to help people. So God said, I will give you that power and put it on those 70 so they can help people. Think how many people must saw all day that you need 70. How many does people does Jesus need for the world? I bet all of you. Does the global call require power to deal with pharaohs of this world? Yeah. See, the more you understand that, the better it works. That's why I said, sometimes Pharaoh doesn't listen to your voice. He needs a mighty hand of God. That's why that's what I'm trying to teach you. Is this the only story like that? I want you to write down Luke chapter 10, the very first paragraph. Jesus calls 70 in Matthew. I'm sorry. Jesus calls 12 in Matthew 10, but in Luke 10, he calls 70 people and gives them the exact same power. He sends them on the same circuit, only in Israel, and tells them, go preach the kingdom of God, healing, throwing demons out their windows. I just like that picture. I just throw them out their windows. This seems like a good place to go. Why the door? I don't want to be happy about it. Here's my point, friends. That wasn't an isolated example. Moses was told to get 70. Jesus grabbed 70. How many of y'all understand co-laboring has been going on ever since the beginning of the world? God has always wanted co-laborers with him. What did I say from two verses ago? God will bring a man to do his will. Remember the move of God? There was a desire and the manifestation of God's will. What was the middle link? He needs a man. He needed Jeremiah to prophesy. He needed Moses for power. He needed Jonah to go to Nineveh. He needed Jesus to talk to the people of this world and die for them. God uses men. But guess what God doesn't stop there? God uses co-laborers. And then God gives them that power. I hope this made sense to you. You see what I'm trying to say? I want you to believe you have a calling. I want you to believe that God wants to use you right now. I want you to believe there's a call waiting right now in your mind that God wants to talk to you about. It's the last story. I'm late. What's the last story? There was a man who would say, I am the least qualified to serve in compared to all of you. This man also said, among sinners I am chief. I'm the worst. I'm as bad as it gets. His name is Saul. In his very start of his life, we read that as they begin to stone Stephen, a man of God, full of faith, full of signs and wonders, he consented to it. As a child, can you imagine being a young man going, yeah, I murdered that dude? That's warped. He said, I'm a warped man. You understand that? He wasn't bragging. I'm warped. And then as he got older, he began to wreak havoc on the very first church. Wouldn't let him hit the brunt of He just wouldn't let him get their stride. He just began to harass them and murder them and drag them out to the streets and torture them and force them to deny God. And not having been satisfied with that, Saul then goes from Jerusalem to where? Damascus. Off to Damascus he goes, and there he has an encounter with the light of the world. His name is Jesus Christ, and he's so bright that he blinds them. And Saul says... Who are you, Lord? And he goes, I'm Jesus, and I have a calling. So tell me, are y'all disqualified because of your background? You mean God will call Saul, but not you? You mean God would use Saul to save the world, but not you? Some of you may say, Michael, I don't have a voice. That's what Jeremiah and Moses said, right? I can't talk. Did God care? Some of you may say, I'm a girl. Did God say that to Deborah? Miriam? Some may say, oh, well, I can't, I'm not educated. I don't know all those words, like Peter. I, I'm, just a, I'm just a sinner, Lord, Luke 5. I'm just, I'm just a sinner. I'm a filthy fisherman. God said, I'm going to make you what? Be, okay, fine. I'll make you a fisherman of men then. He'll just take what you said and use it back at you. God has never pushed back by our mistakes. But some of you, friends, I just want to put this thought out there. We'll close it up. Some of you are feeling that plateau. Some of you say, Michael, I don't have a passion to serve God because I feel like you've you probably hit a place where you've kind of hit idle. Maybe you've been running for God and you kind of hit this place where it's just straight rolls. You're like, man, is that it? Am I done? I've been there. I've been there where I've been serving God for years. I'm like, man, I, I hit this flat road. I want to tell you again about this man named Saul. 
It says in Acts 9.20 that Saul began to serve God immediately after he was laid hands on. Remember the man came to his house and laid hands on him, raised up, opened his eyes. It says that Saul began to preach God immediately in the same synagogue. After that, he went, that was in Damascus. Where did he go next? He went back to Jerusalem eventually. Acts 12, it said even Barnabas began to go to churches and preach the gospel, preaching that Jesus is the Lord. Until when? Acts 12, 25. These guys spent years preaching the gospel until Barnabas, and notice the name of Saul, okay? His name is Saul for years. It's not Paul, it's Saul. I want you to listen. They returned from Jerusalem when they had what? Fulfill their ministry. Is this the end of the book of Acts? Can y'all listen to me? Acts chapter 12 is 28 chapters. Saul and Barnabas filled their ministry. Who understood that? How many of y'all in a plateau? How many of y'all feel you fill, finish your single years? How many of you feel like you finish your time with your job? How many of you feel like I've hit a plateau in my run with God? How many of you feel like how much longer do I have to be Saul? I've done my job as a convert. Have I finished my call? Do you understand what I just said? It says they did. Oh, listen. They did fulfill that. They fellowship the ministry. Saul in his early years, the Saul that had just converted, the zealous Saul who chased Jews and said, I was that murderer that hit you for Jesus. He's real. Jesus is Lord. Those young years, it says he what? Fulfilled the ministry. But that's not all. How do I get a greater calling? How do I get out of this plateau? How long will I be in the same position I'm in now? I feel like I've done everything I'm supposed to do. Now what? That may not be you, but if you just listen. Maybe that's not here everybody this morning. But maybe that's you. Maybe you just feel like I've done everything I'm supposed to do, God. What do I do now? How long am I in this position? When do I go back to work? When do I change job? When do I get married? I've done everything I'm supposed to do, God. Next, next chapter. This ends with the next chapter. Acts 13. Verse 1 through 3. It says, in the church, there were certain prophets and teachers. That's why I said you need all the ministers in the church. Barnabas, Simeon, Lucius, Manaen, and Saul. That is a total of six people. What did these six people do? Verse 2. They began to minister to the Lord and fast. And the Holy Spirit said, now I have a new call. How many of you understood that? You're not done. Maybe you're done with your Sunday school class. Awesome. You get a total of a whole six people and they minister to the Lord until the Holy Spirit said, you two come here. This is the grab Moses and Aaron. You two come here. Where do those guys end up going? They go to Gentiles. In every nation in that world knew. You get that? A young Saul spends his life chasing Jews, saying, I was wrong, I was a murderer, I'm sorry, come back to Jesus, I was completely wrong. And having finished that thought, God said, come here, you're no longer Saul, it's in that chapter he becomes here. Paul. You have no idea who you're going to be. You seriously have no idea who you are going to be until you chase the calling of God. So let's stand up and do that. Verse 3 says this, friends, Acts 13, verse 3 says, Having fasted and prayed, they laid hands on them and sent them away to go. Get mad at them. They probably don't see them again for years. That is a call. That is a call. I'm not telling you guys I'm going to kick you out now. No. But do you feel like you have a bigger picture of who you are in Jesus? I really pray that you do. I really pray that you do. My desire is that every one of you understand where we began. I wanted to destroy that myth that somehow you're not called. That's a lie. Somehow you're a lay people. You're just church goers. That's like just sitting on a you know, chair and watching LeBron. That's ridiculous. You're the guy that God's putting on the center court. You're the guy that God will train and use. A girl. And then I said, why are you not feeling that passion? Why are you not, why are you comfortable just sitting here? Because I believe some of you have not been exposed to what God can do through you. And if you see the ministries of an apostle, a prophet, or evangelist, or teacher, or pastor, when you see these things, you go, you know what? That's incredible. I would like to do that. 
Or if then you begin to go to a service group like Star of Hope or a Christian group like the Samaritan's Purse where you actually use construction labor and help build people's houses after floods. There's still godly men and women and they go help people with skills. And you just do something for God. Then the call grows. And then you hit that plateau where you're like, man, I've been out of a job for years. I've been out of work. Or I've been out of the situation. I want to move all my life. And God says, have you fulfilled your ministry? You can say yes or no. And you say yes. Who asked God to continue? Did God come to these men or did these men go to God? I'm going to ask you again. In Acts 13, did these men go to God? Yes. They pursued the call. Was the call waiting all along? Yes. See, when I was, we go to prayer, again last week I asked you to do this, but now you're going to do it with a bigger understanding. I want you to pick up the phone again. Phone is prayer. And you can say, God... You've been waiting all this long. See, I've been talking to God about my needs, my thoughts, my personality, my wants. You, I've just been thinking about the things I desire. But all that time for these 30 years, or if you mean 39 years, all those years you keep talking to God about what you want, about what you need, and how can I get this, how can I get that, how can I get this? There's a call waiting, there's a call waiting, there's a call waiting. And finally these men say, I'm going to pray and fast until that call is answered. And in that prayer, the Holy Ghost opened his mouth and said, time to go to the Gentiles. That was unheard of. For then being Jews, that was unheard of. It's like telling her and him and you, we're going to go hit up the penguins. Literally. We're going to go evangelize penguins. They're going to think you're crazy. That's what it looked like then. You're crazy. But to serve God with all your might, there's nobody like Paul. That book goes another 15 chapters of some of the craziest stories in the world. Where is the book of Acts? Because I'm going to close this series with this thought. Where is it? It's right there. Do y'all know that? Do y'all see the answer? That's why I put this on YouTube so you can study. Where is the book of Acts today? It's that phone call. It's been waiting right there. All your years, like, oh, where's Acts? Where's that? Oh, God's turned the problem. No. The call's been waiting.